I'm going to talk about visualization. And in particular, um, this is a big topic. There's lots of different ways we might visualize our data. And so I'm going to start by talking about the, the slice plot class. And this notebook is up online on that GitHub that Madikin, I believe, shared the link with um, either in the chat or on the Slack. And if I make any updates to it, I'll update it there as well. And we'll, we'll be sure to send that out uh, more as, um, as the workshop continues. We'll send reminders to where that is. Um, part of the reason for starting with slice plots is that a slice is sort of the, the easiest um, way you can imagine taking some three-dimensional data set and making what has to be a two-dimensional image because that's what our screens or or the papers that we publish are going to show and so the slice is is as as the name implies simply taking a slice through the whole data cut in the intersecting your data volume with some plane and visualizing the data values that that plane intersects so um, I'm going to use the same data set that we've used before. I'm not a cosmologist, so some of these fields have no meaning to me. But um, this is a, a reasonable size data set that, um, that, you know, it won't slow down this presentation because it's too big to, to visualize. But you can certainly go back through this notebook and rerun it with some other data set, um, hopefully one of your own just to get a feel for how these different operations work. Um, so just to, just to sort of tie some things together from, from the morning, the way I think of YT is the primary, primary design of YT is to enable you to visualize volumetric data. So this is where you have some physical location in the volume that can be indexed perhaps by an X, Y, Z. There might be some complexity in that with a AMR hierarchy or an unstructured mesh or, or something like that. But YT inside knows how to find a value for a given point X, Y, Z. And so at every point X, Y, Z, you have one or more associated data values. And somehow you want to make an image from that. So the different plot types that YT does includes slices, which we'll talk about today, projections, which uh, Medikin um, sort of alluded to some in the previous, previous uh, tutorial, uh, and that'll be a focus tomorrow. Simple plotting a line through there uh, or, or profiles. Uh, Matt showed this neat animation, which I have no idea how he made, where he had this cool curved path and it was updating the data values as it went through there. Um, phase plots, which uh, Stephanie will talk about tomorrow. Uh, and volume rendering as well. Uh, and stuff that we, we won't talk about surfaces, but uh, I imagine that's something we could talk about uh, in, the, um, in the free time. Um, one of the things that I always do when I need to make some sort of plot or I need to do some sort of analysis with YT is I start with the cookbook. And the cookbook is a section of the docs. Let's see if that comes up. Uh, it does. Um, that uh, basically has simple recipes, the code and the output following it uh, for how to do different visualizations or different analysis in YT. And for me, 90% of what I need to do can be answered just by scrolling through here, finding an image that kind of looks like what I want, and then, um, uh, then using that to to adapting that recipe to my own needs. And so a lot of what I sh will show today uh, has some lineage in the past to, to the cookbook. The other thing that I would mention um, is that uh, hopefully at some point, some of you will want to contribute back to YT itself. And if there's a type of visualization that you do or, or, or analysis that you do that isn't represented in the cookbook, adding your own recipes back to the docs is a great way to get started um, contributing to the YT community. And that's something we'll talk more about on 
um, on Wednesday, sort of the, the community infrastructure. But that's the way I got started with YT is trying to add some examples that, that to me were not as cosmological um, and apply to the way I think of data. So always start at the cookbook is sort of my advice. Um, oops, and I have no idea what I just did. Uh, problem of having too many windows open. Oh, I think I, I think I separate that out. Okay. Um, so Madikin already showed us the field list, and so I won't go over it in all this detail. Except I will um, admit that the difference between density with a capital D and density with a lowercase D is something that has confounded me in in the front ends that I work with they're the same but for Enzo data they're different so um, I'll switch somewhere midstream in this notebook and um, that's just because I, I forgot to capitalize things at some point um, so just to get started uh, Medikin did an, a, a wonderful overview of how to do different types of reductions on data and one of which was uh, a cut through the data and then she showed how to plot that. The, the slice plot method itself, it's actually a, a class in, in YT, provides a nice high level overview, uh, high, high level interface, excuse me, to doing what she had done in that notebook before. And at its simplest, it just looks something like this. yt.sliceplot, give it the data set. That's the data set that I read in at the top, the, um, the isolated galaxy data set and uh, give it the uh, orthogonal direction. That is, uh, I want to make a slice that's perpendicular to Z, so it's going to be the XY plane, and give it a field. And when I do that for this isolated galaxy, which I'm not a galaxy person, this doesn't look like a galaxy to me, but I'll go with the title of the data set. Um, I have a slice through the data. And by default, this is gonna slice through the middle of the domain. And by my selection, it's gonna slice in the, the Z direction. I could uh, slice in X. And so then if I slice in X, I see that my axes now are uh, Z and, and Y. It looks largely the same. So this is something that's uh, somewhat of a spherical galaxy. Few things to note here. This example is something that's called an axis aligned slice plot. What that means is that I am using one of the three coordinate axes as my normal to the slice plane. That's actually rather natural. If you think about the simplest way to represent volumetric data, just a cube of data, there's, in terms of how the computer thinks about it, there's a natural uh, way to slice an array and do that operation. So this is actually um, probably the simplest way you can do a slice, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I don't think I'll talk about it today, but I'll talk about it tomorrow. You can define the slice to be um, off axis at, at, with the normal as some arbitrary vector. Um, another thing to notice, and this is something that causes me great confusion. And so I take a little bit of time to dwell on it. The coordinates here are, um, are rescaled such that zero, zero is at the center. So the, the whole coordinate system has been shifted such that the center of the plot window is the origin of coordinates. Um, I don't know why, I think that's just a historic artifact in, in YT, but we're gonna quickly undo it below because I think it's more natural to have the coordinate axes um, conform to what the coordinates were in the actual data set. Another thing to note, um, the units have propagated through and they appear on the plot, megaparsecs. Um, and this is in terms of the code units because as, as we learned, myself included uh, earlier, this capital D is a field on disk and uh, it's stored in terms of code mass over code length cubed. If I change this to, to lowercase density, it, um, it uses the alias. I don't know what the exact term was that Matt, Matt used for uh, this morning, but now I have the more familiar grams per uh, cubic centimeter. 
these are tiny values for me, but I'm told those are absolutely fine for a galaxy. Uh, I mean, that's like round off for me. Um, okay, so um, so let's make it. Let's make the plot a second time. Oh, oh, and the the other thing that also is perhaps uh, unintuitive is that by default the log of the density is plotted. For most of the plot variables, the a log is automatically applied. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the shifting of the axes can be a source of confusion, and we can undo that. And we can undo that by passing in a keyword pair. So the keyword um, argument is origin to specify how you want the origin of coordinates to be defined. And we're going to set it to native. And what that means is use the, the natural coordinates that the data was uh, had in the simulation. I'm also going to capture the output of uh, yt.slaysplot into a, an object, a variable just called sp. And if I actually, if I don't do this other sp here, it just does its thing but doesn't show the plot. And so if I want to show it, um, I guess you could do sp.show, but in Jupyter, if you just um, x, just put the um, the object itself on its own line, it'll show the, the plot. And now if I see this plot, now my axes have been scaled uh, or unscaled, I guess, so that they um, agree with what the natural was on the disk. And so now the origin of the coordinates is lower left. That's what it was. If you read in the, the um, if you look at the actual information that was output, when the file was read. Okay, so I captured the output of Sliceplot into a variable, and I can look at what type that is. And if I do just the Python type command, I see that it is an axis aligned slice plot. That's what we had talked about before. Axis aligned is the special case where the orthogonal direction is one of the coordinate axes. It's part of the plot window module. Uh, in visualization in YT. And if you actually have your YT source somewhere and you navigate to YT slash visualization slash plot window, you can look at the gory details of how this is implemented. Um, I usually do help uh, help, uh, and then the, the option, but it seems all the cool kids this morning were doing um, S do, using the question mark, which is I think just a Jupyter specific thing. Uh, and as as with all all the other YT features, there's extensive help provided by the doc string that um, that the function provides that tells you all the sort of things that you can set in here. And we'll go over some of those uh, very soon. Um, you can save the image. So operating on the the slice plot. Um, uh, object that I stored, I can use the save method and save it to disk. And um, if I do ls, I see it's there. And this is the current time. Um, this is an image magic command. If you have image magic installed, I, I usually like to just uh, look at things. And it shows that uh, it's 1302 by 1104 pixels. It's a strange number of pixels. Uh, and that's because um, by default, I think it removes any excess padding. And I was going to, let's see, this is where we try to do things live. If I, if we actually look at the slice, you can see this is what the, the slice plot looks like. It looks like it looked like on my, uh, in my Jupyter screen. We might have squashed it a little on here. All right. Um, let me find where I am in Jupiter. Okay, so usually after you make your first plot, the next thing I want to do is I want to change the colors just because I want it to look pretty. Um, I'm going to remake my plot. Oh, I'm not going to remake my plot. I'm still working off that same uh, slice plot object. And the first thing I'm going to do actually is I'm going to change the, um, the data range. So if I look up here, 
it plotted the full range of density as it appeared on the disk, something a little bit less than one in code units up to a bit more than a million in code, lim uh, in code units. And I can change the data range by using the set ZLIM method. And I give it the field density, I give it the minimum value, I give it the maximum value. And when I do that, it's gonna spit out a new plot. And now you see the, the color scale ranges only from 10 to 10,000. So I've clipped the range and anything that's more than 10,000 in density and code units is just clipped to yellow. And anything that's less than 10 is, is this, I don't know what color you'd call that, but whatever color that is. Um, and so restricting the data range is, is something that you probably want to do pretty often if you want to just look at specific parts of, uh, of the field. And then finally, you can set the color map. Magma is, is one that I like a lot. It kind of looks, uh, looks kind of fun. Uh, you could pass in any matplotlib um, color map. YT has its own color maps. The default, I don't even know how to pronounce that, Arbre or, or so, uh, is the default color map. Uh, if you go to the YT color map page, it'll show you examples of all the different color maps you can choose from. Some of these are better than others. There's, there was a lot of effort in the, in the last few years to make color maps that work well for um, all different types of color blindness and, and reproducing black and white and, and so forth. And the default's a great choice, but there's other ones that also work quite well. Um, all right, I'm, I'm assuming that someone's keeping tabs on the, the hand raising and I'm just going to plow forward until I'm interrupted. I have seen no hands raised. Okay. Thank you. I, this is my first acknowledgement as well that people actually hear me, so that's always good. It's a very surreal experience doing this virtual. Um, yeah, all right. I can't stand talking to my own screen. I, it's weird, yeah. Also, Medikin has her hand raised now. Yes. Um, okay, do you have a favorite color map other than magma? Anything like uh, fun you like to use? It depends. So, so I look at vorticity a lot, mm -hmm. um, and or, or or entropy, magnitude of vorticity, mm -hmm. and so I like the symmetric ones, like the BWR. I think that works well for that. Um, um, I don't know. I I tend to like the reds. I think so. I think that's why I like the magma over the over the default one. Okay, I cool. Just play with them. Certain ones, like if you're plotting something symmetric, like velocities can be positive or negative, I like for a neutral color to be in the center. I think it, it helps your eyes more. That, that's the way I normally think about it. Uh, okay, but this one I think looks cool. It looks like magma. It looks like a volcano here, I think. Um, all right, so now let's zoom. Um, Again, we're going to work off of the, the object returned by slice plot, the slice plot or axis aligned slice plot uh, object. And we can just, uh, this is just making the same plot I've made before. I'm going to stick with the origin equals native because that's how my brain works. And after I make it, um, I can zoom. And so I just do use the zoom method. So sp.zoom and give it a zoom factor. And now I've zoomed in by a factor of two. And something that I, I think I knew, but I always forget and then relearn, is that if I call zoom a subsequent time, it zooms off of the previous zoom. Uh, let's see, so, oh, I just reran that. Um, so now this zooms a factor of four from what that previous factor of two was. And this zooms a factor of five further still. And you can really start to see the structure. You can also start to see um, the where the coarse data is and where the finer data is, because it's nicely preserved in uh, in the way that it's plotted. That you actually see, um, in, in how I think about it, sort of the finite volume nature 
of, of the underlying data in this case. Um, I'm going to regenerate it again. So I'm, I'm going to be resetting the plot a lot of times as I, as I do these things. And I'm always, uh, actually, this is where this is where I discovered I wasn't always doing the same thing. I thought I was always doing the same thing, but now I slipped in the lowercase density here. Uh, and the scale is more uh, physical, but these are really small numbers to my mind. But here's our same slice plot as we had when, um, when I started out earlier. And now, instead of just calling zoom, oops, I, that was me executing that. Instead of calling a zoom by some arbitrary factor, I'm going to set the scale, uh, the size of the box that I want. So this overall box is a megaparsec. And I'm going to say that I want to set the center of my box to be 400 uh, kiloparsecs along x, 400 kiloparsecs along y. Notice that when I use set center on the slice plot, plot object itself, I only need to specify two coordinates. And those are the two coordinates in the plane. Because I've already chosen the coordinate in Z in this case that my slice plane intersects. And so now I'm choosing just the coordinate in the plane to actually uh, set my center in the plane. And I'm going to set the width to be 200 kiloparsecs. So this is going to be something right around here. And it's going to go from like here to here. It's going to give me a little zoom in of this region. And both of these are methods that operate on that axis align slice plot object. So I'm doing, I'm building off of that previous plot that I made. I'm doing sp.setCenter, giving it the coordinates in plane of my center, sp.setWidth, giving it the physical width that I want. Uh, I brought in that kiloparsec unit from, from the YT unit system to let me do that. And this is what I see. And um, it looks like, I, like we said it should look. If we looked above the, the center of the galaxy, or again, I'm not a galaxy person, whatever that is, is just there in the corner, as it should be if I started out a um, hundred kiloparsecs off the origin in each direction and have a 200 kiloparsec box, then this is going to be the upper right corner for my plot. And so I could see that I've done that. And this is a more controlled way perhaps to zoom where you, you actually set exactly what it is you want to, you want in terms of the center and the width. And a lot of operations in YT work in terms of passing in a center and a width. I think I said this already. Um, when we use set center, we only specify the, the coordinate values in the slice plane. Uh, alternately, if I do it when I generate the slice plot itself, I can specify the center now as a tuple with three values. And the since this is a, a slice orthogonal to Z, the first two values are the center in the plane. And the last value is the Z coordinate that my slice plane is actually going to cut through. So by default, it was going through the center of my data set. Now this allows me to specify exactly which point, including in that orthogonal direction, my slice plane is going to cut through. And uh, again, I can specify a width. And when I do this, it looks very different. The color scale, the, the data range is much smaller because now I'm off. Um, uh, I'm 100 kiloparsecs away from the center in the orthogonal direction. And so I'm really only seeing the outer parts of the galaxy where, where the density is much smaller, or, or so I learned in galaxy class. Um, so that's pretty cool. And so that gives you pretty fine control over exactly how you want to do your slices. And, and of course, you can. I've been using Z because I've been lazy, and because and my last name starts with a Z. Um, but you could do X, Y, or Z here to do uh, your slices in, in any of the three orthogonal directions. Tomorrow, we'll talk about the, the off-axis slices. Um, so there's many ways to set the center of the domain. If you get help and ask for help using either the question mark or help 
uh, slice plot and look at the center, you'll see a lot of these. Um, in addition to just specifying a, an actual tuple with the values, you can specify the just center or the letter C for the domain center, max or M for the maximum uh, of, of density, min, uh, min for the, and then a field. So I can make my slice plot of whatever field I'm looking at go through the minimum or maximum of some other field. And so these are useful things that you might want to do if you're looking um, for the behavior of your simulation, simulation around extrema, for instance. And so I left this as an afternoon exercise to play around with this setting of the center, uh, setting of um, the center that the slice plane plots through to instead try to do it based on some, uh, some physical data feature, like where the temperature is the highest. All right, so, um, so that's the basic uh, overview of slice plot. We're going to do two more things today. We're going to look at how to make, how to visualize multiple fields. So slice plot can actually take a list of fields or a tuple of fields and do the operations on all of them. But there's a little bit of, um, of work that needs to be done if you want to uh, group them together in a nice array of, of, of figures or axes, if you use the matplotlib lingo to make a sort of publication quality plot. And the other thing is we're going to look at some of the annotations you can do. And there's an enormous number of annotations. And we're just going to look at a few of them. And I'm going to encourage you to look at more of them in the afternoon period. So. Um, so I broke a recipe that was, um, well, this is kind of based on a recipe that was that was in the slight, the in the YT docs in the cookbook. I broke it up into different Jupiter cells to try to explain the different steps that are going going on there, and hopefully that helps it be a little bit more understandable. So slice plot can take a sequence of fields. So any sort of sequence in, in Python, a list or a tuple, and it'll generate slices for all those fields. And then you can access those different fields using the same sort of dictionary-like behavior that Medikin had demonstrated in the previous, in the regions thing, where she was selecting just the density part of a region. Um, we're going to use some features of matplotlib to control the layout. So YT is going to do the, the cutting of the data, figuring out what data to, to display and, and the scaling of the data and basically generating everything. But then we're going to rely on matplotlib to actually do the layout. And this is a common uh, thing that we might want to do. Uh, using matplotlib gives us a lot more um, ability to fine tune the structure of our plot. So I'm going to load matplotlib um, in the standard way, loading it as uh, pyplot as plot. And I'm going to load from the axes grid toolkit uh, the image grid. And, and an image grid basically allows you to create an array of axes. And that's the first thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to create a figure. So plot.figure just returns a, a matplotlib figure object. And that figure object is where I want all of my data to reside. And then I'm going to create an image grid. And the image grid takes the figure that it's going to live on. It takes, um, this is just the, the location in the figure in terms of, of the normal coordinates in, in a figure that the, the plots are going to sit within. And so, this is kind of like the default, a little bit, give a little bit of a margin on, on all sides. Then it takes the number of rows and number of columns, two rows, two columns. Think of this as an array. Uh, some padding between it. I don't actually know what this 1.0 means physically. It's one of those things that you play with. If there's too much padding, you make it smaller. If there's too little, you make it a little bit bigger. It's, sometimes these things are, require a little bit of iteration. Label mode L means that I only want to show the, the labels 
on the left side and on the bottom side of my grid, since I have an array of axes, I don't need to show the, the label everywhere. And I'll point that out when we make it. Each one, each axis is going to have a color bar. And I put a little padding between the color bar and the axis just because I like the white space there. Um, hey, Mike, I have a quick question for yes. you um, based on the previous slice that you showed with the zoom. Can you tell us whether um, YT scales the color map when you zoom like that or whether it sets the bounds to the data set min and max? Oh, so my understanding is it is setting it to um, the local slice. Okay. Yep. So, I mean, look at this. Mm -hmm. This is a much smaller data range than when I plotted the, the full thing, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. So it seemed, it, 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 I mean, it seems to me that it's dynamically adapting. Whether there's some padding to it, I don't know. But it is looking at the local region when it's setting the, the bounds. Yeah. Okay. You, know, you can, of course, override that. Mm -hmm. Right with the set zlim that we looked at before. Um, this is just one of those fun bits that because I divided this up into uh, different cells, the Jupiter is interpreting the output of of the previous things and actually showing me something. So this is what my bare image grid looks like. Um, you can sort of see the L here. I only have the tick marks on the left. And on the bottom, not here, because this axis shares the same x as this one and the same y as this one. Uh, anyway, that, that'll, that'll go away in a second. Uh, now I'm going to produce a list of fields. Density, velocity, x, velocity, y, velocity, magnitude. For most uh, codes, velocity, magnitude will be computed on the fly because it's just the magnitude of velocity, x, and velocity, y. We have a code where, of course, that's not the case because we like to cause trouble for YT. Um, but for most codes, this will do the right thing. Um, I'm going to make my slice plot. I changed my notation. I'm just calling it P now. And uh, I'm going to, in there, by default, it sets the log for everything. I'm going to turn off the log for the X velocity and the Y velocity. They can have negative values, and I don't want that. So I'm going to disable that. And this is not going to do much. It's going to say, and I'll talk about this bit in a second. Uh, oh, actually, it does do much. Hang on a second. Um, it's going to say that it's done, um, it's looked at each of those. So uh, density, velocity x, velocity y, velocity uh, magnitude. So it's actually looked at the data, produced the slices for those, gave me a little warning that there's some negatives here. And if you're doing a log, it's going to switch to, to uh, sim log later. And then here's what, the, here's what it outputs. It actually outputs, um, when you're sitting in Jupiter, it shows what those plots look like. So here I have four plots. They, they look quite nice. I'm not sure what's going on with this one, but I didn't make that data set. Um, but um, but we want to arrange them in a nice grid. So we have the plots. They're there. They're sitting somewhere in the internals of YT. But um, currently, they're four separate plots. I want to make a nice tiled grid. So what I need to do now is I need to reach into that plot object, access the underlying, uh, uh, that slice plot object, access the underlying plot data, and link it to those matplotlib axes that I have just created. And so that's what we're going to do now. And this is, this is something that's not obvious, I would say, um, because it requires some knowledge of how YT puts things together under the hood. That's why the cookbook is such an invaluable resource, because this information is provided there. So, uh, so we're going to use that matplotlib layout. We're going to loop over the four fields that we use to make our plot. And we're going to assign the underlying plot itself to one of the axes on the, that we created with that image grid. Um, there's some quirk in Jupiter that I didn't have time to debug when I wrote this, that if I don't sort of manipulate the, the slice plot object right now, this all sort of falls apart. 
That's only because I decided to split this code up in, across a whole bunch of different cells to make things better. So if I figure out a fix for that, I'm gonna I'll fix it. But I have this uh, zoom in here just to sort of refresh the the plots. Then I loop over my fields. This is the list of fields I input. Um, for each field, um, I access the underlying plot. So the slice plot object has a plot. Um, it's not a, a dictionary, but it's something that is like a dictionary that holds the actual plot. So this is my current plot. I set the figure attribute of the current plot to be the figure that I created. That's the overall matplotlib figure. I set the axes to uh, one of the four axes that I created. So I use the enumerate here. So it'll be zero the first time, one the next uh, two, and then, then, um, then three. And likewise, I set the color bar axis, that's what CAX is, to the, the corresponding color bar axis that the, grid, the, the image grid created. And then I need to tell the slice plot to sort of redraw things. And that's what this last command does. And I do that. I don't see anything because now these things live in that matplotlib figure. If I look at the matplotlib figure, I get this nice plot with the, the four separate fields all shown on the same figure in that two by two arrangement that I had asked for. This is now being controlled by matplotlib, at least that's the way I think about it. This figure is a matplotlib figure. And so I can use the matplotlib um, commands to operate on it. So for instance, if I wanna save it, I can use save fig, which is the matplotlib command. And let's see if I saw that terminal open and I've, I already forgot what I called it. I think it's multiplot. And if I could type correctly, um, here's, my, here's my underlying plot. And it looks small. You can see matplotlib allows you to set the DPI and so forth. So you could play around with it and make it, uh, make it the resolution that you want it to be. But that's a nice way to be able to um, produce something. So this is sort of, um, there's two ways you can think about using, or two ways I think about using YT. A lot of times you have a notebook that you just run through when you're doing the analysis, but then you make the pretty sort of publication quality plots when you're writing all this up, up for paper. And so putting everything together on a common set of axes is something that you might want to do in that case. Um, there's more advanced ways, really cool looking things, if you look at the notebook, that really rely on using matplotlib to control all aspects of, of the layout. So for instance, producing some sort of plot that looks like this, that's pretty nifty, don't ask me what it is. Um, and so I gave a link to one of the cookbook recipes that, that shows how to do that. Um, and now I'm back to my notebook. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, ways to do annotation. In matplot, uh, in YT, these are generally all termed callbacks. And so the idea is once you make a, a slice plot, or as we'll see tomorrow, this also works for projection plots, you can add a number of callbacks to it. These are uh, this is basically a list of the different types of annotations you want to do. And when you make your plot, it's going to run through all those callbacks and add all those annotations to, to the plot. So I'm going to remake my plot. Um, can I ask a question first? Yeah. Uh, Mike, um, so uh, if you go back to your four panel, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. So when I'm making my figures, uh, these, these numbers are all right on the money for me because I, I run galaxy stuff. Yeah. Um, but I don't actually want that times 10 to the seven at the top of my color bar. What I really want is, um, this to say velocity Y and then the units to be 10 to the seven centimeters per second. Right. Do you know how to do that? I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. I, maybe I've done it before, but I can't remember. I if you're asking me, can I do it for you right now? The answer is no. Okay. Um, okay. I bet, I'm sure I it can be done. It can be done. Yeah. I personally like that 10 to the 7, but, um, mm -hmm. but that's maybe a me thing. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I guess it all depends on how close you're going to want to squish your um, panels too. Right. So, so basically, what I mean, there's definitely a way to do it. In the, in the the most extreme absurd way that you could do it is create a derived field where you just divide right. it. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm that sure might there's a way to do what it. I've done. I'm yeah. sure there's a way to do it other than that, and maybe Matt or Medikin. Uh, you can you can I mean, set the units to be uh, ten to the seven. Uh, centimeters per second. Okay, so somewhere. Awesome. So under set underscore unit. So yeah, if you call p dot set unit set. density, or I'm sorry, velocity y. Yeah, set underscore yeah. unit. Unit. And you can specify more than one at a time here in uh, in the call. You can put it in a list. So velocity x, velocity y. Um, and if you set it. The, the second argument to uh, one e seven times I'm sorry in a in a string times cm uh, over s it should do it. So I doubt that. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Indeed. Very cool. All right. Well, cool. Thanks. Uh, although it only did it for velocity x. Oh, well, maybe you got to call it twice then. Or Sorry. maybe I spelled velocity <laughs> wrong. <laughs> no. Nope. No. Okay. So I guess you got to do it twice. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. cool. You, can Very also, cool. you can also access all of these, like with the matplotlib axes that you assign them to. And so you could manually override yeah, whatever. Yeah, that is thing. messy. That is very messy, but it is an option if you yep. really feel like uh, getting into the nitty gritty of Matplotlib. And cool. I try to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> yes, it's a good Axies thing. in particular in Matplotlib are, are, yeah. Yeah, they can definitely, but, um, but because YT is like, all the viz is subclasses of Mat Matplotlib objects, yeah. you can access the axes through the plot interface that you are creating all your plots through. Oh so uh, yeah, you can plot, you can pass the keyword arguments directly through. Yes, yeah. right. And so that's another option that you could take, but it's not as um, sophisticated as overriding the units, but it is yep. another option. And I won't ask Matt how to get rid of that 1.0 there. But, um, I would not be able to tell you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for the questions and most thank you for the help. Um, that's cool. So let's see, I have a little bit more, more time. So I'm gonna show the, um, the velocity field. This is something I always like to plot. Um, there's, there's actually several different ways to visualize vectors in, in YT. Annotate velocity relies on the code knowing uh, your front end knowing what the velocities are um, which is set up i believe for pretty much all the main simulation codes and it'll show the little velocity vectors what the actual um, uh, direction and magnitude of the velocity field is and uh, the factor here is basically a way for you to thin out the velocity field i think it's in terms of number of pixels so you can see, I can really show lots of arrows, maybe lose some of the detail or thin it out some um, and get a, a sort of coarser flow, feel for it. There's ways to normalize the velocity arrows or provide a scale to them, uh, which I leave as an exercise later on to look at the normalize and scale. So these arrows sort of overlapping perhaps is a bit confusing as you look towards the center, but there's ways to, to reduce that. There's also streamlines. So there's an annotate streamlines. Streamlines are basically where you integrate the, you, you pick some starting point and you integrate the trajectory of, uh, of a, say a fluid element by using the local velocity field to make it, uh, to tell you how the velocity is changing. And so you get these nice long streaks in your in your your plot and there's also a line interval integral convolution which to me 
is basically what happens if you ask Van Gogh to, to visualize your stuff. It kind of looks nice and streaky like that. Um, visualizing the grid is something I always like to do as well. Um, again, there's a callback for that called annotate grids. And if I do that in my slice, it'll actually show the patch structure of the AMR. You can see the different levels are colored in different colors. Some of the colors don't show up too well here. So there's kind of a purplish color hanging out here, but you can see the nice, um, this is a nice way for you to, for instance, look at the domain decomposition in your, uh, in your, your simulation or to make sure that the resolution's sitting where you want it to. You can also visualize not just the, the patches that make up your grid hierarchy, but you can look at the individual cells. If you turn that on for this, it'll look crazy busy. So you only wanna do that when you're really, really zoomed in. Uh, that's not something I use, use much, but annotate grids I think is, is a nice way to just to get a feel for what your simulation code is doing. Um, and so uh, there's a lot more. You can draw spheres, you can draw contours. I already mentioned streamlines, and I encourage you to look at some of these after uh, this afternoon to add annotations to your plots. Um, I didn't do it here, but I'll do it in the projections tomorrow. But you can also do the slice plot on a region, like uh, Medikin showed us this morning where you can cut a sphere and then just look at the slice in that sphere. And so we'll do some of that with projections tomorrow. We'll look at visualization, these, these visualizations with, with regions. We'll also look at off axis stuff tomorrow. Um, so when you're not, your slice plane is not aligned with X, Y, or Z. We'll do it for projections, but it's the same basic idea. Um, and a final note, there's a simple wrap, uh, this should be say simple wrapper called Plot2D, um, which allows you to plot 2D data. Uh, where is it? Oh, so this is just what the, what the call is. Um, allows you to plot 2D data, which essentially a slice is a 2D uh, visualization of your 3D data set. If you have a 2D data set, it's kind of trivial, so you don't have to pass the orthogonal direction. That's basically the main thing that this happens. Uh, one caveat, you can still use the main slice plot for your visualization. Uh, even if you're, you're 3D, the orthogonal direction is gonna be the, for your 2D data set is gonna be the direction that you're not simulating. Most typically Z, if you're 2D, you just have X and Y in your code. Um, one thing, however, is for 2D axisymmetric data, that's something we do a lot. Then you're modeling R and Z and you're gonna pass theta as your orthogonal coordinate. But this is something that the plot 2D should do naturally. So that's all I had on slices. And as I said, tomorrow will sort of be the part two of this where we dig a little bit deeper uh, and do things on projections and look at some of the same stylings that you can do there and some more advanced stuff. I'm gonna stop my share so I can actually see people. So we got any more questions? No. Um, did you link to um, all of the annotations that are available in your um, annotation docs in your... Um... I'll do it in the next one. In the oh, project. okay. Okay, great. Yeah, because yeah. I encourage all of you to look at the annotations that are available. You can like annotate with um, like labels, like you could label specific points in your on your plot or something like that. It's not just like field wide annotations. So there's lots of really nice customization that you can do. So for and I'll show this one tomorrow. But one of the things I do often is I want to show the simulation time on my plot. Yeah, so there's an annotation for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was going to show more of those tomorrow. Okay, okay, perfect. The the multi-panel figure took, you know, is is the most conceptually challenging thing that I showed. 
but I think that's such a common thing you want to do. So I, I, I wanted to go over that. Yeah, I think that was like, that's something that's super important. All of us um, do it at some point, I think, so. In fact, do, set, writing this inspired me to maybe explore whether there could be some more higher level function to do all that magic. Ooh, more YT uh, contribution. I, I, think there, I think there should be. I, I yeah. Think there, well, I think there could be. Yeah. I support it. I think that'd be great.